This is Father Gregory Pine. This is Father Bonaventure Chapman. And welcome back to God's Plenty. Thanks to all of those who support us. If you enjoy the show, please consider making a monthly donation on Patreon. Be sure to like and subscribe to God's Planning wherever you listen to your podcasts. All right, we're very blessed this episode, this guest planning episode, to be joined by Dr. Matthew Minert on the occasion of a publication of a new book of his. But mind you, he publishes many books, so depending on when this episode airs, he may have published another one in the interim. So very delighted to have you, Dr. Minert. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Well, thank you for having me, Father. Both Father. <laughs> there you go. Um, if you would, uh, for, for our listeners, if you would just introduce you know, where you're coming from, what you're working on, who you are, so they can get to know you a bit. Sure. I'm coming to you live from the, well, I guess it's not live, only now. <laughs> Don't <laughs> tell <live>. them. <laughs> <laughs> from the Byzantine Catholic Seminary. Uh, I'm a uh, Byzantine Catholic father, uh, father and husband who live in Western Pennsylvania. I teach primarily for the uh, Ruthenian uh, seminary, which is located, Ruthenian Catholic Seminary, which is a, a Byzantine church with, in union with Rome in Pittsburgh. Uh, and we actually are the Metropolitan Church of Pittsburgh. Um, we also form the Melkite uh, Catholic Seminarians here in the United States as well. I'm a professor of uh, philosophy and moral theology. And I also do a little bit of teaching as well for uh, Holy Apostle Seminary. Because uh, I, there I can do a little bit more Thomism openly. Uh, whereas, you know, here I am forming Eastern clerics. Uh, but I'm a father, father of two uh, young ladies, um, two years old and four years old at the time of this recording. Um, and yeah, I, I was a former Roman Catholic who was raised in a very Slavic Roman Catholic background, uh, a bit of a liturgy junkie as a Benedictine for three years, uh, and then discerned out in the midst of simple vows and sort of peregrinating about uh, especially in the traditional Latin community. I never quite felt at home spiritually, really, um, after leaving the monastery and even there. And then I just fell right in love with a poor church from Transcarpathian Ukraine, uh, the, the Ruthenian church. So it's like, you know, no one knows of the Ruthenians and no one really knows what Transcarpathian Ukraine is. It's just really Western Ukraine and all the stuff that floats around near the edges of like Poland and Hungary. Um, one of the earlier uh, Russian Byzantine Orthodox churches to come back in union with Rome. Um, and so a pretty big presence in the Rust Belt. And so right locally, uh, I ended up starting attending Divine Liturgy and almost fell in love immediately. So, yeah. So just a little bit about it. Okay. Well, so as pertaining to uh, an Eastern Catholic rite, and as working theologically on a lot of Western Catholic things, you're perhaps best known in many Roman Catholic circles for translating a lot of the works of uh, Garrigou Lagrange, which are presently on offer. Um, what's that like? Is that like a, I mean, I wouldn't want to say that it's schizophrenic on account of the fact that I don't think that we think with two minds. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I guess the, the, the reigning analogies are that it's, you know, East and West, we breathe with two lungs, but it might feel a little bit intoxicating to breathe that much oxygen by comparison to us mere single writers. So what's, what's that like to be stretched in that way? It is quite odd, actually, and it's something that I get stretched also on campus about because, of course, my, you know, aspiring clerics have come in, you know, with a, a great desire uh, to be authentically Eastern. And, you know, I've had to learn how to do that in a way that's not just sort of aping, you know, what they what sort of the general Byzantine ethos is, you know, regarding Eastern Byzantine theology. Um, and so, I mean, actually, in many ways, I've come to see my role, at least here, let's well, say like my vocational role more broadly as being able to articulate to my Byzantine brethren, actually the Tom Thomas school positions of all things, which seems so strange, because I think it's the, the best Western position actually for kind of interfacing on, on almost all, all the themes. Just to take for an example, the moral theology uh, content, if you take some of the great Dominican masters from the turn of the century, be it Garrigou Lagrange or Juan Arantero or Ambr Ambrose Gardet, or even someone like more of a pedagogue, Jordan Amen and others, um, all that, all that stuff is is very amenable to the, the main thrusts of moral and spiritual theology. It's more spiritual theology in the Byzantine world, actually. There's not a lot of moral theology per se. It goes and lives in ascetical and moral theology, uh, or in spiritual theology. But so I kind of I can articulate as a safe person who can art, who can you know present the uh, Thomist view on occasion and show sort of points of connection, you know, with with 19th and 20th century things. Uh, to my brethren. I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I was primarily a, um, 
liter- like from a spiritual perspective, Benedictine and, and um, liturgy guy, script, this is where Lexio Divina and liturgy was all. So that never caused an issue. Yeah. Um, but it, it's strange sometimes though, right? Because I'm doing day-to-day things where I sometimes even tell the seminary, don't post it. You know, on Facebook, the conscience book just came out. Uh, with Clooney Press. And I just said, don't don't even post it on the public page because you're going to get the people who say you've got a Latinizer who's there. So I don't, you know. And occasionally I've been- Kill doing, him. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> this is a throwback before the Second Vatican Council. You know, you're you're once again Latinizing our theology. Yeah, Trojan and I, horse. And I, yeah. protest, I protest a little bit like that uh, at CUA Press, you know, we decided on the title Catholic Dogmatic Theology for um, Jean-Hervé Nicolas' text. But that's what it is. You know, it's 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 a Thomist synthesis is what it is. And I mean, I'm not against it for that. That right. But to call it Catholic dogmatic theology sort of bothers me as though there's this one theology. So yeah. it, it has stretched me, though. I've become more of a pluralist, this strange Garaguvian pluralist. Um, mm. So I don't know. Yeah. I, I have a text with CUA Press that will come out with the Nouvelle Theologie stuff from Garagou, but also from some of your other confers, Labradat and uh Marie Joseph Nicola. So it's just such a strange thing in my world to be on the side historically that is associated with with being, you know, the most sort of uh, trenchantly Roman. I, I just I, I like blasting narratives, though. So if I can keep my mind and have the grace to do so, I, I'll keep doing it. So, yeah, well, you wouldn't be the first person who'd passed off mere Thomism as Catholicism or something like simpliciter. It's kind of one of our our sticks. Um, what's interesting though is, is uh, here's another fact. So like, I mean, this episode, you gave this opening monologue and you used a ton of big words and usually big words involve Latin, but these all were, as far as I could tell, English, but they were just of different countries. Um, so I want to like hijack this episode and turn it like, all right, Ruthenian, North and whatever sort of thing. But I'll just say this. Oftentimes you have, so you have converts to Catholicism, people who leave from, you know, from Protestantism to Catholicism. And then you have a Catholic who becomes more Catholic, you could say, or what have you, is called the revert usually, right? But I think you're, well, I don't know, you're like a, a, you're a convert to Catholicism because it sounds like you were always Catholic and not like, you know, kind of, you know, C&E Catholic or what have you, but like always a, a serious Catholic, but then you became a Byzantine Catholic. So you're, you're not, you didn't revert to Catholic, you converted, but within Catholicism, which is a move that I think in logical space of like a movements, people didn't probably expect there would be something like this because you're, you're still Catholic, Mm -hmm. but you're just now Catholic, but different kind of Catholic. (laughs) So when I I often think that, of course, for Catholics, uh, Roman Catholics, um, converts sometimes bring something to, because we're kind of always learning Mm -hmm. about the faith. So I'm a convert myself, just a standard convert. Now I'm going to say standard convert because now I've met someone who's actually (laughs) like a, a Catholic convert to Catholicism, but uh, we're always learning. So in some ways, we're actually good to explain to people from the outside, you know, like, mm-hmm. actually, this is a distinctive Catholic practice or, or prayer or something. And you probably just were used to this because you, but this is really different and interesting. So in some ways, that's, that's helpful. And then two, the cool part is for, for you, you get surprised, you know, like you walk in and you genuflect to the wrong place. And you're just like, you're not used to this when you're first growing up as a, when you first turned into Catholic. So I just ask you quickly, um, uh, one, do you think it's, do you do you find that you're able to explain to these 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 Byzantine Catholics and uh, you know large name Catholics um, from the outside coming from their perspective? Do you think you see something different in there? And then two, um, have there things been? Is there anything like surprising that you've learned or like you know? It turns out you were like washing dishes with an icon or something. And they're like, no, we don't do that. And you're like, oh shoot, I didn't know we shouldn't wash dishes with an icon. So like an example of just be, being a Catholic convert, non simplicitaire. Yeah, I just think of the second one more because I'm sure I've had those moments because it happens here at the seminary. Um, well, I'll tell more of an amusing story at the second half. So uh, that I don't know if I did something wrong, but I didn't know to do something was told and was didn't know if they were trying to to get me actually early on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I do find myself you, I, I function as articulating vocabularies across both both directions as well, right? So this becomes you know very Roman Catholic audience sometimes when I do like online appearances. You know, we're asking questions, you know, how can I, for instance, be so positive about St. Gregory Palamas? Because there are these issues with divine simplicity, which are the only things that people know about. So, you know, trying to learn how to not lose my mind, because I don't think you guys would call John Duns Scotus a heretic on his position about divine simplicity, although we all want to wink and nod that it's deeply problematic, the formal distinction. 
but you know, everyone. the same world is that it's in that same world. And so like, you know, but also too, I mean, there, there are other, other things that sort of come up that like being able to articulate West and then East, I find more important actually, because I can, especially to my students, there are lots of false narratives that float out there because of Orthodox polemics that for the sake of trying to form an identity within an Eastern Catholic context, folks pick up sort of stereotypes about what it means to be Western, let alone Thomist, you know, um, that even though there's been so much better you know, scholarship and ecumenism in the past, let's just say 30 to 40 years, the main kind of mainstream narratives of a century ago just echo forever. Um, and a lot of that's because so many people, and you probably know this too as a convert then, people convert and then they're just livid at their, at their tradition. I know a, a Benedictine priest who once said to me that at one point after his conversion to Catholicism as a young man, and then maybe 15 years in or so, he had to reconcile himself with Martin Luther because he had so strenuously rejected it because he read The Three Reformers by Maritain. And he said, you know, there, I, I had pieces of my mind that were too, you know, I still had a deep affection for him on some level because it had formed me and I needed to mm -hmm. reconcile that. And sometimes people come in with just that oppositional, I'm not what I was. And so I'm really trying, you know, I have the benefit of having done this in my 30s. I'm going to try to learn from the mistakes of my 20s and not be so reactionary. Uh, so the second thing is just quickly, it was holy. It was the, you know, whenever you guys were putting on your black uh, kappas uh, on the Feast of the Holy Cross, uh, you know, the Holy Cross is sitting, icon is sitting out with uh, sort of on our, our tr um tetrapod where we stick the, the icon in the in the church it sits in the middle of the aisle and normally you go up and ve venerate the icon well one of my students who really did sort of look at me askance uh as being far too western and i i was pretty you know philosophically and theologically western at the time teaching he you know he shows me you know to to fully prostrate on all the sides of the icon but then we were the only ones we were the last ones coming in so i don't didn't know if he was just trying to to see what he could get me to do because I didn't know what to do. But you know, I've since found out, you know, okay, thank goodness he wasn't pulling a fast one on me. I mean, it was a, you know, it was a devotional fast one. So at least I didn't look a fool, but. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, and uh, before Father Gregory jumps back in the center room, I just point out to the, to our listeners, um, dear listeners that uh, you mentioned your mistakes in your twenties that you don't want to repeat. And most people, when they hear mistakes in the twenties, they would think of say things that would be in a moral theology textbook, for instance. Um, but I think you were referring to like Benedictine liturgy. Oh, um, so, yeah. uh, so just be aware that, yes. that, that ladies and gentlemen, you can use these words like, you know, when I, I made some, you know, I, my, my twenties were wild. Um, you know, I was praying the daily, the divine office and, uh, you know, it, most, spending most of my time in silence. So I think that's, I think that's a fast, you know, I was a use of performer. use of t t yeah hothead and uh passionate 20s yeah you know? I, I was there for the end of father bonaventure's 20s just a, a few years after his conversion and it was a constant rodeo of self-discovery or of catholic discovery uh so like which direction you would genuflect up for grabs you know it's just <laughs> really hard to say but uh we made it through <laughs> we did still learning <laughs> Incredible. Yeah, there was one, one of our one of our brothers, uh, Father Gabriel Toretta, who's a doctoral candidate at the University of Chicago Divinity School. He um, wrote a little article at one point about the discoveries that he found himself constantly in the midst of making when he converted to the faith. And then he entered a religious life and it just upped the ante. So there's mm -hmm. one point at which one of the brothers, you know, put his hand in the holy water font as he was entering the chapel and then extended that same hand to Father Gabriel. And he's like, what in the world are you doing? <laughs> and the idea was, I have made this holy water font more accessible to you by extending my pre-dipped hand. And he's like, this religion is nuts. <laughs> so it's good. It's good to be able to look at it with a kind of strangeness. I feel like there's something Chestertonian about that, to arrive at the place from which we started and to know it as if for the first time. But speaking of which, maybe kind of uh, tending back into the direction of moral theology, I think that, uh, you know, you made some initial distinctions there with respect to the Eastern tradition. So Eastern uh, authors often talk about moral theology in terms of what we would call ascetical theology or mystical theology, or more broadly speaking, spiritual theology. In the Western tradition, sometimes we're drawing different distinctions. Um, and if you want to have a lively conversation, you can discuss these with the aforementioned Father Kajetan Cuddy, who will reject all of them on good grounds. Uh, but some people make distinctions between like fundamental moral theology, right? So we're going to talk about beatitude and human action and passions and habits and virtues and vices and law and grace. 
And then they'll talk about special moral theology, where you're talking more about virtues and particular cases and things like that. And then things start kind of changing. 16th, 17th century, and people start talking more about law and obligation and conscience and X, Y, and Z other things. So you, as kind of living in both worlds, as it were, or inhabiting both traditions in a certain sense, uh, what do you feel like, you know, the 21st century is is a time in which we're recovering some of the riches of moral theology that's scriptural, that's patristic, that's medieval, as a way by which to present it in uh, in an organic, sincere, recovered, delightful way. Um, and you just wrote this book, which is a kind of summary of Catholic moral theology, or in a certain sense, a summary of moral theology. What's your hope to to recover, to transmit, to communicate about the church's vision of the moral life? Yeah, I, I think that... Uh... Maybe the, one of the guiding themes is something I said in one of these interviews for Ascension Press that then got clipped out for one of their little prom promo things. And I keep using it because I think it hits and you'll know exactly where this is coming from. The truths of dogma are the absolute truths of our lives because what we know through faith informs actually all of our actions as an anticipation of eternity. And if you don't understand that way that, you know, the beatitude that was Christ's beatitude that we now participate in through the gift of you know, divine adoption and grace, if you don't understand that, you're going to completely misunderstand the divine vocation that we have as Christians. So, you know, steeped in really in many ways in your tradition um, of trying to place the, the notion of beatitude central, centrally, although also bringing in themes of incorporation into Christ. Um, you know, I wanted to, to articulate, you know, moral theology in a way that, you know, is, is dogmatically informed. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, go into the council. I don't go into the councils of the church or something. But, you know, for instance, you know, Christology figures in the background of, of some of the, the chapters early on to make the point that there's not this sort of division within our landscape of knowledge between dogma next to morals, rather to see, you know, to see in the end how our beatitude really is to live those two great credibilia in our ourselves as we are divinized, namely the inner life of the Trinity and Christ as, you know, the redemptive savior into whom we are incorporated. Um, you know, in a way, I, I do see my project, though, as being in line with that elan of divinization, deification theology that your own theologians as Dominicans were so good about in the, the 20th century. And it's, you know, just an echo of aspects, at least, of the, the tradition uh, that we in the East you know, refer to as theosis, which is, although it's it comes from, you know, different kind of desert vocabulary, the way that we often articulate it, um, it's fundamental elan is the same. And that's what I wanted to articulate in this book, though, in a way that's not a moral theology textbook as much as it is as a, a text that's accessible essays on divinization and then on the virtues. So I do I do sort of, if we will, you know, what general or fundamental moral theology and special moral theology together. <laughs> But I deny all these distinctions as well. There is no such thing as Christology. Get away from me. Take your Lutheran distinctions and run away. Um, so, sure, whatever. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, the, you know, the Eastern thing, the project of divinization and uh, deification, if you're Augustinian or something. Um, I've always thought, you know, it, it sounds so strange uh, to people because, well because of who we think we're divinized towards, you know, I mean, I, when we think about God, I think we think of like superpower sort of thing, omniscient being, creator of the universe, you know, ex nihilo, all this kind of stuff. And when we talk about my being divin divinized, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to create things ex nihilo. I don't think I'm going to have omniscience. I mean, I don't think I have any of the properties of deity, right? So divinization always strikes, initially it like strikes me as kind of nonsense metaphor. Um, but, and here's the thing you mentioned, is that it's the shape of the divinization. It's from Christ. So now that's something we can be, in a sense, divinized by because we can participate with Christ. We can be formed like Christ. And this is where I think often people have a sense of Christ as an example. Like he's, when we think about Christ in moral theology, we think about him as being like an example. So like, what did Christ do? You know, what would Jesus do? That kind of thing, right? I mean, that kind of, you know, you wear, the Protestants do all this time, wear those little, those, I don't know if they still wear those little wristbands, but WWJD, you know, like, what would he do when I think about sort of thing? He's an external kind of figure, but you're drawing again, the tradition here and in this, in this book, it's, it's very accessible. It's an excellent book. Um, I don't know if I have time to mention one more thing about it, but um, you're trying to say, no, no, it's not so much about his example, but his his in a sense causality his relation to us through the sacraments through grace particularly 
So that when we talk about divinization, we're talking about divinization through Christ, a, a person who has a human nature. That's kind of a divinization we can, I, can, I can make sense of and start to f- kind of cash out in my moral life. It, does that seem a fair characterization of, of the area? Yeah, this is correct. Uh, even though I was not as influenced by it when I was writing this book, it's like the, the beautiful account of exactly what you just said in uh, Columba, Dom Columba Marmion's uh, The Mystery. Christ and his mysteries. Yeah, I was trying to think. I don't know if that's in a contemporary printing or not, but it's a lovely meditation basically on, you know, the mysteries throughout Christ's life, like the life of the life of Christ or whatever that treatise is in the, the third part of the Summa Theologiae that try, he tries to make this exact point that, you know, yes, Christ is kind of moral example, but the very mysteries that we find in each of those stages of Christ, we could say pre-life, um, you know, uh, before before even uh, the Annunciation, and from the Annunciation onward, you know, all the way through the sending of the Spirit, we see, you know, if we if we take a very mystical reading of Scripture, all sorts of meanings for what our truest identity is, as we are refashioned by the Holy Spirit to at least have the same supernatural knowledge and love participatively that God has of Himself. And, you know, we unpack this. What's the purpose of the rosary? But to actually meditate on these mysteries, you know, throughout the life of Christ, because those, you know, they, they reveal to us if we pray and meditate and wait for the action of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, they, they purify our faith so that we see what the, the true destiny of man is because of the whole mystery of salvation history in this man who is also God, Christ, who is into whom we are incorporated. You know, um, so that's our fundamental identity is to be in Christ. Um, yeah, no, it's like, it sounds woolly headed, but it's the ex monk in me that likes it. Right. Well, it's, what do you do? Go pray the, like be deeply liturgical, you know, even as a, a lay person, you know, your new liturgy, of the hours, isn't the long monastic meandering thing that the Byzantine one still is right. You can, as a lay person, very much get a liturgical sequence in your life. Um, you know, and, and you just, you slowly circle over the mysteries and find a way to make them present all every day. And, Trust some spiritual authors and they'll introduce you to the, you know, the deep meaning for your own identity as a Christian. You know, not merely, you know, the moral example, but, you know, when you think about, you know, the perfection that we're called to, Sermon on the Mount bears witness to. Um, yes. Because well, that's the perfection that, like that, a merciful father. So, yeah. Yeah. No, that's the and it, initially divinization sounds woolly. But when you put when you put um, the wool back on the sheep. Um, with Christ, then, then you have like a, you have an organism now and it makes sense of it. So when I, but to see just, it gives it, gives it shape, gives it yeah. concrete a sense that, because that is the divine, that is the God man. And so man can be godlike in that way without it being either pagan or kind of metaphorical nonsense. But Father Gregory, you've, I mean, this is a sort of thing you do as a pastime, right? You write and think about sort of Christ as being a part of the moral life and this kind of relationship i think you're writing a you're doing some sort of i don't know some sort of article on it maybe or something over there uh, so yeah. probably you have you have questions for, for him <laughs> as well yeah that article is like 372 pages at this point <laughs> um yeah i was I, I mean as you're asking this question that's the question that my dissertation treats and um i am thinking of one treatment of this issue by uh, louis bertrand guillon uh, in the middle of the 20th century he writes christ and moral theology or whatever it is in italian and um, he's asking the question, like, how does Christ inform our moral life? And there are some people who are contemporary with him who do the wild and woolly thing. You know, like Christ is all about table fellowship. So we just need to, you know, cozy on up to all kinds of types. And that will be the summit of perfection. It's like, well, what does that mean? You know, like, and, and, and he's cognizant of the fact that you can't just read Christ off the page of the sacred scriptures. Mm-hmm. You can't just be like, oh, Christ is sitting on a well and he's talking to a lady at midday means I should sit on a well. I could find a well. Do. There's a well. It's just like, right. So <laughs> we want to be inspired by by sound, you know, Christological thinking, if I can use that adjective, which we just ruled out about seven minutes ago, um, in order to gain access to the riches, which Christ brings to bear in grace, virtue, gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I think like one, one of the things as part of my thesis or part of my dissertation is this whole kind of trajectory of accommodation that like Christ makes the divine life not not available, whereas formerly it was not available, because it's always available insofar as the divine causality can be brought to bear on us, you know, before, during, and after. But that he makes it, St. Thomas says, he makes it closer. (laughs) He makes it less remote. He says he makes it human. But I think this notion of accommodation that Christ 
like makes the he makes the moral life manifest to us and in making it manifest he communicates it and that gives us a way of reading sacred scripture it gives us a way of reading the church's tradition whereby we're able to recognize our life in his which fleshes out this idea of divinization like father father bonaventure was gesturing towards so when it comes to recovering sound christological thinking at the heart of moral theology you know where where do we read christ or how is christ spelled out for us in your work or the things that you've written on recently Oh, can you just react? Just ask that a slightly different way. I'm just not 100 yeah. percent sure. Yeah, yeah. He's, sure. Remember, he, remember, he's Byzantine Catholic. So if you could throw in <laughs> some sort of, you know, energies, saying, perhaps like, where oh, do you find Christ's oh, energies? Oh, yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I guess um, maybe within let's let's place it within a spectrum. You've got your Hans Kung and Bernard Herring types, and I'm about to make a you know chop job of their work. But the type of stuff that makes us nervous, where it's like Christ is basically about the least, the lost, the least. Therefore, and then you just draw all kinds of politically informed conclusions about it, which would make us a little bit horrified. And then on the other hand, um, you have a kind of insensibility or insensitivity to the sacred scriptures. It's like, let's get rid of these texts. They're unscientific. You know, they're not really meant to prove anything demonstratively. So like, how do we think, how do we put on the mind of Christ? How are we transformed by the renewal of our minds? How do we gain access to the Lord who makes the moral life like open, available, rich, uh, exemplary. Uh, and how do we, like, how do we do that as, you know, an ordinary Christian going to mass, somebody who's praying the rosary, somebody who may be like dabbling in the, the liturgy of the hours, like, what does that look like? Uh, and, and how do we go about it? Yeah, it's just a huge question. I'm sorry. I'm still, I'm like, I thought maybe <laughs> reformulation. So, okay, let's, let's actually just be a little bit more down to earth, the structure of the book, which helps us see this, right? Like, yeah. I, so I we take the virtue approach to, they, like you Dominicans do, you know, and I ask questions, you know, sort of within my own meditation on scriptures over the years. And truth be told, my own meditation on scripture during the COVID year, which is when I read that, wrote this. So I did, you know, sort of, very, I used to be a software engineer back when I had a real career. And I did this like table of various scriptural things and, you know, sort of pulled them out as I was reading and what would be related to various virtues and whatnot. Um, and I, you know, I, I try to emphasize that you know, the encounter with scripture and the encounter with liturgy primarily, which is sort of at the heart of, of the maybe sp spiritual advice that's in this book, which is not so much in that tone. It's more in the tone of what are, what does it look like? What does the virtue of charity, let alone fraternal charity, look like in exercise for others, you know, for whom, for whom you really are as absolutely self-abnegative as the saints, giving of yourself up, sorry. Um, you know, what, how is acedia or sloth, if you will, how is it the asphyxiating, you know, lack of love that destroys the spiritual life? And it's sort of draw from here and there in the tradition, right? Um, but all of it circles around, uh, in, a, in a sense, the, the polarization around the, the call to the mystical life, that all of this becomes either by way of merit or by way of, you know, the actual experience passively. Um, you know, of the Godhead present and acting in us, operative through especially the theological virtues. Um, you know, and so I just once again, it's a meta, it's, a, it's kind of a meditation on sc scriptural themes related to the virtue ethic that we share, is how I think of it. You know, there is the tone is a little bit in that, and it's not, you know, I'm not navel gazing myself. I occasionally self reference if it's, you know, self deprecation that's a, very appropriate, but I don't do that very much. But it's, you know, personal tone of sort of my own synthesis of these, these themes to try to, you know, articulate how, you know, the idea of virtue is not necessarily, you know, a kind of Aristotelian striving for our perfection, right? It's, there's a sense in which the Christian life is not a moral life primarily, it is the divine life. We are called to be friends and equals to God. You know, your Amber Verde makes this point very beautifully in uh, the true Christian life and the, the essay, the fundamental idea of the Christian life or something like that um, volume coming out, CUA press, it might come out before this, com this podcast comes out. Actually. <laughs> it's, it's live. So that's not possible. Um, <laughs> so, you know, sort of, you know, trying to articulate how, you know, a virtue based ethic is not, is, you know, is not something that's just, you know, let alone moral right or wrong, but even kind of moral perfectionism. Uh, it's a way of refactioning ourselves in this little crevice of our being that it too can reflect with this or that infused moral virtue, which is nothing more than a kind of reflection of charity, you know, in the means of living out the, the divine life. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that complete that directly answered it, but it answered it in a way that I feel like was an answer. So well, 
Yeah, and, and it's good that you turned to the to the book. Um, first off, I also want to make the point that it looks like you're involved in the order of PhDs. So we're the order of preachers, and you're the order of PhDs on your name there. Um, but secondly, <laughs> so your book, when I was reading it, um, it reminded me a little bit of that. I don't know that that little brown book that people have, My Life or something. My, uh, it's my the Summa, it's My Way of Life. It's a short, short little Summa commentary thing, which I love to give to people because it's just so delightful. It's winsome. It's it's very it's practical is the silly word practical sounds like there's bullet points in the back and like do this do that but it's practical in the sense that it's 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 very life affirming and life involving and and down to earth all these kind of these words that usually don't involve uh, or wouldn't be something to describe the stuff we've been talking about um but i did so like i but but it kept every your book is as you said it's it's a personal reflection but not in the kind of hack need you know how some people start homilies with like a story and then they actually do the homily and they they think it relates but it really doesn't um but that it's it's really integrated it sounds like you actually believe and live this kind of stuff and i remember so like for instance the passage on on uh uh, modesty and temperance so you're doing sobriety and you're doing the virtue here and it's about like modesty and dress and i'm flipping the page and i'm waiting i'm thinking all right we're gonna start talking about what we should be wearing and how much you know how much we should be wearing this sort of thing and you want to give examples and you give the example of like dressing up as a professor so you take it to your your terms and talk work through that and it's it's an issue you think well that well, no one here is a professor and has to decide whether they're going to wear a bow tie or jeans and a t-shirt sort of thing. But what it does is, as I thought about it, is it roots it in the actual practice of the speaker who's who's integrating these things. If you had spoken about, I don't know, anything, uh, something else, immodesty and some other, it would seem like it was it wouldn't be coming from your integration of these principles. And while not all of our listeners yet will be wearing bow ties or professors, um, it it had a, a, a the reign of someone who thought through these things, and it was they were the right kind of examples because they were personal examples, not extraneous, but thinking through the principles involved in that. So it's it's a delightful, and that the book is filled with these. So that anytime a hard uh, teaching or a hard topic or something comes up, you immediately give it these nice kind of anecdotal things that are related. They're kind of Dominican anecdotes, so they're actually really teaching. They're not about kind of stories, you know, which is great. There, you know, in a sense, you know, rhetoric's really important. I mean, even actually in theology, even for those of us who like scientific theology, because you can find a way to, it's like that image in Plato's sophist that I love, where he, he's, he's struggling with how Socrates looks like a sophist. And he has this big statue. He talks about this statue that you have to, you have to kind of uh, twist the shape a little bit because the head's way up there and the people who you're talking to can't see the brow, you know, or whatever, right? So you have to distort the image a little bit in order to make the statue understandable to these little, the people who are below, you know, well, this is what it's like anytime you're sharing knowledge with someone else, because you're trying to get them to see things they don't see yet. And so by me sharing that, I'm inviting someone in to, to them. If I can give them just the right conceptual nucleus in the middle of my own exposition, they form their own idea of like, okay, what's appropriate to me in my station of life, mm -hmm. right? You know, as, as regards, you know, what I should be wearing, you know, in different, you know, contexts. Um, I was hoping you would talk about weekday cheese, but you have to buy the book to find out about weekday cheese. I did. I was, you know, there were a couple, actually, I, I bookmarked a few of the, uh, these kind of examples there. And I went for the bow tie one, um, probably because I'm, I'm the, the weekday cheese, but yes, there is a mention about the difference between solemnity. He's got progressive cheese solemnity. <laughs> so it's very important that you, you talk. To this is very dear. This. It's, it's a joke with a cousin of mine that, that we had once upon a time. And I, I put it in, it just came to me and I, I sent her a note and I said, let's see if the editors let this in. So. Aha, got him. Yeah. Because <laughs> life is a joke. Sometimes inside, sometimes outside. But it's a good joke. Um, all right. Well, thanks so much. We're about out of time. Uh, but if you wouldn't mind just uh, by way of summary, just letting our listeners know the book, where they can find it, uh, when it might be out or when it is out and uh, how they can go about getting getting in touch. Yeah, so uh, the book is made by God, made for God, Catholic, uh, Catholic Moral Theology Explained. It's available at ascensionpress.com slash Catholic Morality. Uh, and other information on me, if you're so inclined, can be found also at philosophicalcatholic.com, philosophicalcatholic.com. That's a mixture of academic and non-academic stuff, though. So You, wait, you got the, you got the philosophicalcatholic.com, like that was... 
You're the one first person who got that, yeah, that web four years ago too. I can't believe it. Holy smokes. That's we gotta think I mean I'm gonna have to meditate upon that. I don't know what that means for the Catholic Church, but okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Good. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure chatting and uh, helpful for me in my own research and thinking about the life of Christ and how it informs our moral lives. So I'm very grateful. Uh, and then a thanks to all of our supporters. If you'd like to tie to our work, please check us out at patreon.com slash godsplaining. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like, subscribe, leave a five-star review. All good things. And then visit godsplaining.org. Uh, I don't know why I put a pause there between godsplaining and org, but whatever. Godsplaining.org to shop our merchandise and to get dates and information for upcoming events, specifically the three retreats which we are hosting this summer, July and August. All right, so that's, that's all from here. Uh, our prayers are for you. Please pray for us, and we'll catch you next time on God's Planning.